And you said that uh, constraints are critical yeah. when it comes to competition. So what are the benefits and the detriments of, of these you know, constraints? So if you gave a group of people all the money, all the resources and the technology in the world, you said solve this problem, what they, you know, people unfortunately typically are, are risk adverse and they're lazy, meaning they don't want to take big risks and if they have all the time and the money, they'll use the time and the money to try and solve the problem. And that's the way it's typically done, at least in large companies and governments. If you stood and said, listen, you don't have all the money. In fact, you don't have the amount of money you want. You got one hundredth amount of money. You got one tenth the amount of time. You got one tenth the amount of people. You constrain it. Mm -hmm. People talk about thinking out of the box. I'm saying, no, no, go shopping for a really small box. And when you constrain the solution and you say, you know, like MacGyver, you only got, you know, bubble gum, a piece of thread, and something to go solve this problem. Right. Most people say it can't be done. I'm giving up. But the person who says, well, how would I do it? And they start trying to figure out how to have their MacGyver moment. They come up with a breakthrough because they're not doing it the same old way. They're having to completely reinvent it on the massive constraints they have. So constraining something and giving people a clear goal that says, first person to get there, first person to break that four minute mile, you know, wins, people start like really, you know, trying to figure out how would I do that? And they get very creative very quickly. Were you worried about the constraints at all? Here was the, the first X Prize. I wanted to demonstrate to the world that a small team could build a private spaceship and get you and me into space. Mm -hmm. Because if we could open up the space frontier, it was the very beginning of humanity moving out. The question is what were the rules going to be? Mm -hmm. and a lot of conversation, but the basic idea, because I'd been thinking about this for 20 years, was, okay, build a private spaceship, had to be privately funded. I want the government money coming. I want everybody worrying about every penny they spent. It had to be able to carry three people in the space. Mm. So it'd be a pilot and two paying passengers, or I like to joke, an autopilot and three very brave passengers, going up, going up to 100 kilometers altitude, which we defined as space. You had to land again, you have to land, and then with the same ship, make the trip again. Is that outside of the atmosphere? It is. The atmosphere Stratum goes up about six. Yeah, the atmosphere we fly in, traditionally, you know, uh, consumer jets, you know, southwest and such, will fly up to 48,000 feet. Uh, this is 328,000 feet, so almost 10 times higher. Mm. And it's, there's no atmosphere. You're in space. you got the curvature of the Earth down below. It's blackness of space above. You're weightless for about three and a half, four minutes as you're going over the top of this flight. So we set those goals and uh, we worked really hard to make sure they were reasonable, they were audacious, like, you know, not easy to do, mm -hmm. uh, but achievable. Because if we set a goal that was way too hard, no one did it, it didn't matter. Right. And if we did it too easy and everyone did it, it didn't matter. So it's a balance between the two that was so important. And it worked out well. You know, Richard Branson came in and bought the rights to the winning technology and created Virgin Galactic. Do you, you have a seat to go up yet? You know what? It's come up a couple times, and I'm wrestling with it. Okay. What, what are you wrestling with? I feel the same way about, like, like safari, you okay. know, and, like, animals. I am so blown away by, like, our, the, you know, the things that we weren't able to let go as a species that we still have in common with, like, the animals. Because mm -hmm. um, we are essentially animals, right? Yeah, we are, right? of course. Right? We just, we just have something else that they don't. When I went on a safari one time, I realized that I was in, you know, this open truck, and it was like maybe 10 of us, and I saw 14, I counted, 14 lions looking at me. And I remember thinking to myself, if I get back to base, I will never do this again. <laughs> because the pixelation on National Geographic is awesome. <laughs> You know, it's awesome. You know, I, you, th listen, we have really good technology these days. It's super clear. It's like you're almost there, <laughs> except you're not. You know, the you're, bath not, you're not dinner. That's right. <laughs> Bathroom break doesn't mean you're you're like dinner for something. And um, you know, I I was so, I was traumatized as a child because um, I remember I was in seventh grade when the first space shuttle crashed. Yeah. And that like blew me away. Challenger, yeah. 
So I'm telling you how that affected me. Yeah. So for me, the Science Channel does such a good job of curation that I take their word for it. <laughs> so let's talk about risk. Okay. All right, because we're, I mean, the stats, people know airplanes are, are pretty darn safe. They're the safest mode of transportation. Totally. Right. At the end of the day, I believe that it's important for people to be able to risk themselves for things they're passionate about. This is true. Right. And so I would risk my life if I had a chance to go and help open the space frontier because it's something that is meaningful to me. Right. And I've risked reputation. I've risked my capital, my time, right? The most constrained thing we have, I've invested in that because I'm driven by that. When the X Prize was going on, I'm in Congress. I'm talking about this to Congress, and this Congress person stands up and goes, Dr. Diamandis, aren't you in fact um, asking people to risk their lives? And some people might kill themselves going after this. And I was like, I was sort of like taken aback sure. by this. And I was like, I had had that conversation a few months earlier that prepared me to answer that. I said, I am, but aren't you happy? Aren't you, aren't you thrilled that 500 years ago, Europeans risked their lives and gave their lives to cross the Atlantic and, and create America? And then hundreds of years ago, 200 years ago, uh, they gave their lives and risked their lives crossing the Great Plains to open the American West. I mean, we're here as Americans because people risked their lives for something they believed in. I took uh, Stephen Hawking up and uh, gave him the time of his life when he was floating in zero G. We're in, a, uh, in the middle of an explosive period of technology. Mm -hmm. I think that these technologies will enable us to build the spacecraft that can go and find these asteroids, actually go out the asteroids and ultimately lay claim to them. Because we can strip this planet and we can mine everything out of it or we can realize that the Earth is a crumb in a supermarket filled with resources. 